Welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast, a podcast created to provide information about what life is like inside the most specialized special tactics organization in the U.S. Air Force. In these episodes, we'll be bringing you the experiences from many of our experts, ranging from our human performance optimization staff, our combat mission supporters, as well as our special warfare operators. Our main objective with these podcasts are to provide the listener with a unique look inside our culture of excellence in hopes that you will make the 724 a future career goal. Now sit back, relax, take some notes, prepare to hear from some of the Air Force's finest. Thank you for joining us on the Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, welcome back to the Insight Through Experience podcast, everyone. Got another cool episode coming to you this week. We have a HPO roundtable, so Human Performance Optimization Staff Roundtable. And what we did was just invite the leads and the experts from the departments inside of HPO uh, just to sit around the table. I threw out a couple of questions at them, then we let them ask questions for the table to answer as well. And really, the simple intent behind this podcast is to give you, the listener, a look inside the HPO team at a deeper level, understand what they do for the organization, what they do for the operators, combat mission supporters, but also how they work together as a team to provide synchronized care for the unit members. And maybe most importantly, we always have some job openings inside our HPO team. So if you're a human performance specialist out there and go to our website, you can view what positions are open. And this podcast should help give you a peek behind the curtain and let you know what the team is working on, why it matters to the world and to our nation, and if it would be a good fit for you as well. It was awesome to sit in a room with these seven folks for the duration of this roundtable. And I wish we could have just kept going, but obviously they're very busy and they're taking care of unit members so really just getting two hours of their time was an amazing feat uh, to get all of them we had to schedule this about a month and a week out in advance because it's hard to get all these professionals together so thanks to all the hpo team for coming out and for the rest of the hpo team that weren't in the room but that do an amazing job to keep our unit and our operators performing at peak levels at all times all right y'all hope y'all enjoyed this one let's get going with the insight through experience podcast hpo roundtable let's do it all right, first, let me start by saying thanks to everybody around the table for joining us in. This is our second um, roundtable discussion that we're having. The first one was with the operators. This time we're with our human performance optimization staff. So what we're going to do now is just start by going around the table and introducing um, every all the panel members. Give us your first name, what you do for um, HPO, and where you came from before you arrived here at the unit. Chad, we'll start with you. Hi, my name is Chad Morrow, uh, command psychologist for the for the organization. Uh, I basically do two main tasks here. One is uh, serve the command psych role, which is assessment, selection, consultation to the commanders, and also as the HPO director that organizes, synchronizes, and helps communicate with the 55 assets we have on this team. Prior to this, uh, I started the 2-3 STS, did that for a couple of years, went to the 2-4 South for a couple of years, and I've been up here since 2017. My name is Maria. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I provide clinical care for service members and here at the unit. Before this, um, I worked at Duke full time in their hospice unit, uh, and I came from Washington State originally, where I worked in hospice up there as well. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm ER doc by trade, uh, coming up from Mississippi. I work here at the unit as the group surgeon, and basically what that means is, although I'm not a surgeon, I'm in a, a billet for a, a flight surgeon role where I manage uh, other flight surgeons and IDMTs um, to support our med training and our guys uh, that go down range. Uh, I'm Wes Carr. I'm a sports medicine physician uh, and I'm coming from the special warfare training wing where I was also a sports medicine physician there. Hi, I'm Barb Thompson. I'm an operational psychologist. Prior to working at the 724, I was an active duty army psychologist. Hey, I'm Ben. Uh, I am the Cognitive Performance Specialist uh, here um, at the unit. I work primarily with the, uh, the DET, um, specifically OTC, uh, and the application of sport and performance psychology to uh, cadre as well as to students going through the course. Um, and I also uh, do quite a bit with the application of technology to improving uh, recovery, mental and physical performance. I've been here since 2017, so approximately just over four years now. And then um, I've also spent uh, just over four years over at USA Socket, JFK Swick, working in their pipelines as well. My name's John. I'm one of three strength coaches here. I got here in 2013. My main focus is working with all the unit members, giving them workout programs, making sure they're ready to go. Um, before that, I was 
with the Minnesota Twins baseball team for 11 years, and I was a strength conditioning coach there as well. So let's start, let's get us warmed up in a positive direction. So I'd love to hear what motivates all of you to drive through these gates every morning and tackle the challenges that you're facing. And this is Brian, uh, command surgeon here. Uh, I would say what motivates me to be at this unit is primarily the mission and uh, the goals of the organization. If you want to be at a unit uh, that's touching uh, really worldwide, uh, 365, 24-7, this is the place to be. And therein lies some of the challenges we face uh, in keeping adequate preparation for all of our deployed members um, at that level of alert is difficult. And so we balance um, day-to-day uh, medical priorities and we sync with our sports med and our psych pillars to ensure that their mental and physical are adequate as well. So the thing that motivates me uh, to come to work in the morning uh, is this is by far the best patient population uh, that you can take care of. We don't talk to them as patients day to day because they're out there just crushing it uh, in the gym, uh, operationally speaking. Um, but when they do get injured and the sports med team has to intervene, it's by far the best patient you could ever ask for. I think the flip side of, this, of that is that the challenge is they're probably the most challenging patient population that you could uh, take care of because you do have to reel them in. You do have to ask them to do a little bit less. Um, so that's a, a fun challenge, but that's what brings me to work every day. Barb here. What motivates me to drive through the gate every morning is the mission. This is the closest as a psychologist I will be to impacting the battlefield for sure and those who are willing to go on it. Uh, my teammates, we hire the best here, period, whether it be HPO staff, contractors, or other active duty members, and that's motivating and it's fun to be around great teammates and overall just the impact um, that I'm able to have, the autonomy through my position on my teammates and then those others that we serve. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have here uh, from my aspect is really the unknowns, kind of not knowing what the schedule is gonna be like sometimes or not knowing where you're going. It can be chaotic and have an impact on the families. We tend to experience some burnout. We hire really high achieving people uh, who will put everything on the line and uh, just as Wes said it's hard to reel them in sometimes uh, before getting burnout and then the last problem is teaching people who are really great at tackling the challenges that they want to, to uh, tackle to also tackle challenges that pop up um, unexpectedly that look a little bit different from uh, the challenges that they want. Uh, this has been, um, so motivation to kind of reiterate, uh, definitely the mission. Uh, the guys here are tip of the spear and anything um, I can do for my position to help facilitate them uh, being the best they can be on a daily basis um, is definitely what uh, provides the in routes for me to come through the gate every morning. Um, with that said, too, I, I really enjoy what I do here, being able to work with both uh, cadre and instructors, as well as uh, students going through their training programs. It's honestly very similar to an athletic team um, who is preparing for um, higher levels of performance and competition. And so because of that, uh, there have been really awesome opportunities to apply the field to uh, their improved uh, skill acquisition, learning, and performance. Uh, the biggest challenges I think I face uh, probably, you know, I, I love the integration of technology. I think it has a, um, it's come a long way. It's got a long way to go. And I think just making sure that we filter through some of the, uh, the things that are out there that um, are not really um, being tied to improved uh, human performance at this point and making sure that we bring in the right type, right type of things. That's a challenge that I think a lot of us are facing in the, in the uh, realm right now. From the strength coaches, um, most of us have either been in college athletics or professional athletics. And when those type of atmospheres, you're dealing with wins or losses, and coming here for me was just a much greater purpose, uh, work with these men and women. And I think for us, the biggest challenge is um, they are away from the unit probably two thirds of the year and trying to find creative ways to get them to stay focused on the program and stay at their optimum shape is the biggest challenge for, for us. Chad, Command Psych, I think the things that motivate me are still the same since I came into Special Tactics about 12 years ago. I think one is we get to selectively hire uh, people in this organization, and here it's 100% of that. And I think just refining that process takes a lot. 
of work. Uh, and I do believe that doing that right, we can do and achieve anything. So I think a lot of the motivation I have is to make that hiring process better. I also believe that we still don't hear no here often. There's a lot of places in the Air Force, the first response is always no. And I think here, uh, it's not often you hear no and allows us to achieve things that no one else can. I think lastly, our team is selectively hired and I think they're the best at doing the jobs that we've hired them to do. And we have more resources and money uh, and abilities to spend money in different ways to make sure that we have novel solutions to take care of hard problems. I think the biggest problem for where I sit, Brian and Wes sit, uh, the command surgeon and the sports medicine doc is filling vacancies. So on the psych team alone, we have five um, and it's very hard to fill those just because it's hard to talk about what we do. Uh, the COVID environment has increased salaries in the civilian world that uh, the contract can't match. And we learn commonly that we need other positions like a couples counselor or an LMFT, that there's not flexibility in the contract to get that. So we hire people with those skills and maybe not um, pay them comm commensurate to that skill set. I think those are the challenges that at my level I face the most often right now. Murray here. Uh, I think that the challenges are what John said, right? It's teaching people to slow down to kind of get the care that they need and the time that they need it because they are constantly gone and being able to understand the processes of, and the things that they might be going through, that is a challenge. I think really what motivates me is my teammates and the autonomy to have my own schedule and to support people in, in different places, whether that's meeting them in the community or here at the unit. I think that I have the freedom of maneuver to try new things and to learn new things and uh, apply my craft in a way that I wouldn't anywhere else. Awesome. So one special thing about this organization is we get to selectively hire everybody. So everybody in this room right here was hired to solve problems. And I know we've discussed a little bit, we've touched on this with some of the answers so far, but what I'd like to do is start with Barb and to find the biggest problem you're working on right now and maybe some solutions that you're employing. And, and what we're trying to get with this question is just to demonstrate to the audience um, what these professionals are working on, what we're looking at, so you can start getting that feel for, does that sound like a place um, that I'd like to be a part of and join? So there's a few sides to this problem. Essentially, the biggest problem that I feel we're working on now as from the op-psych position is our tolerance for risk, how we're evaluating risk and when and if we're hiring that, and then just the efficiency and effectiveness of the unit uh, to meet the mission. And just trying to, um, trying to do that involves a lot of different things. It, it involves bringing outside uh, you know, research entities in to make sure that the science behind all of our processes is uh, locked on. And it's also a constant education and re-education, not only for ourselves, but for uh, our unit members and for our commanders when it comes to hiring and risk, the risk we're willing to take, the risk we need to take in order to meet the mission and to balance those two. Uh, so I think the, the biggest problem, probably from the cognitive performance realm, would be the consistent um, measurement of uh, cognitive performance measures. Um, so um, the cognitive domain has been uh, stood up at SOCOM, and so there are some guidelines pushed out about that, which I think will actually really help the field um, within the military environment across uh, the broader spectrum of SOCOM, not just AFSOC, but also um, Army, Marines, um, all the different uh, branches, if you will. So I think, you know, just making sure that we get um, the, the right assessments in place that are also somewhat attached to the operational environment so that we are, you know, assessing key things like attention and working memory, target discrimination, some things in some way, in ways that are actually relevant to the guy. And then, you know, finding good solid ways to track that consistently across their careers. So that would be the biggest problem. No. And then if I'm an operator, why does that matter to me? I think, you know, other entities have baseline measures, especially here at the unit. I think we probably have one of the more advanced baseline programs um, in SOCOM. And uh, I think that, um, you know, if, if we can attach it here, then we could set the standard. And I think for a guy, why does it matter? It's, it's one more thing that they could be tracking on themselves across their careers where, you know, if something starts to, you know, drop off, maybe we can, you know, have you know, some kind of intervention that's going to help them, you know, maintain that, that level of cognitive performance um, and realize that that's just one more piece uh, to the puzzle where all of the other folks in this room are uh, taking and collecting measures that are all interacting together. From the strength, co uh, strength coach perspective, we uh, constantly try and improve our buy-in in the unit. Um, you know, guys aren't always here, so we got to try to be creative on, on how to get guys in the door. 
one of the ways we started, we have a um, app that we can program all the workouts on. They have videos to show them how to do it. Uh, a few other things we've started, we have what we call speed school, which we um, teach them fundamental techniques of um, linear running, lateral running, and different techniques on how to start and stop and how to teach these guys to move properly. Um, we also have started out with a, a strongman school, which is kind of cool. The guys like that. So we're teaching them how to lift heavy object properly, like you'll see, like the, see on the TV, the strongman. And guys are really digging that. And then we've had a leaderboard just try to get some uh, competition going in the weight room and all that because kind of help guys get guys in the door. From the command site position, I would probably lump it all under how do we truly get to prevention where we hire very green people and keep them green. I do think we have some unique ways how we tackle that. I think first and foremost is kind of like what Barb said, how are we improving and refining our selection process to make sure those people are really green and we have a good identification of the risk and potential so we can manage that throughout their tenure at this organization. I think we have a process that we call peak performance that really is run by you, Trey, that we support that gives people all the skills that we know that they need to stay green throughout their time here. And we weren't really doing before 2016 or 17, but that allows them to actually run for a long period of time and take care of themselves. Coupled with that is our baseline program, like Ben had mentioned. It is the most robust that I'm tracking in the DOD, um, and I think that's because we have commander, operator, and HPO buy-in for it. But uh, every operator since 2017 is baselined. Every intelligence specialist is baselined, and every STS or half of STS is baselined now, which allows us to give them actionable feedback once they start to fray so they don't fray and break. I think our reset process is where there's forced function because the commanders man make it mandatory that they'll sit with a doctor of every flavor, be it a psychologist, a sports medicine specialist, a uh, social worker, um, a surgeon. They're going to get feedback on those baselines so, again, they don't fray. And then lastly, we have a pretty robust extension process where we know that this place, if we hire you green, you're going to turn yellow. And then the psychologist will sit down with you and make sure that you're a good shade of yellow to keep working here. But it also drives the, the referrals to the sports medicine team and the medical team that people might not get if we didn't have that forced function. So I think I think we're doing good things for prevention, but I think if we're going to go into these next theaters of war, we should learn from the past 20 years and, and develop those programs to stay preventative in nature. Maria, on the clinical team, I think the biggest problem for us is a good problem because we're embedded people get used to the idea of seeing us face to face and they prefer face to face meetings but that's not always available because of the TDY schedule or being all alert and so normalizing meeting on WebEx or via FaceTime and using technology like VA apps to be able to do um, clinical care when they're not here and I think that getting people used to the idea that we don't have to sit down across from a table together in order to get that care is um, been a challenge, but also something that we're working towards. Brian here for Med. Um, to caveat on all the things that Psych had said, and keeping people green, I would say probably the biggest problem that we have um, on paper from the Air Force perspective is how to keep uh, our $10 million assets, our operators, operational in an organization that has exceedingly large and continuously growing reach and breadth across the world. Um, but from a personal standpoint, as an operator, uh, everyone in the organization is on a first name basis. And if you come here and work for us, we don't value you because of what you can do. Yes, we value the mission, but we also value you as a teammate and a person. And, a lot of this organization kind of runs like a family. Uh, one of the things that's very special about here is that um, we not only want you to have the medical care that you're gonna have at any other unit uh, working in the military, we want you to have above and beyond that. So you're a text message away from communication with your doc or if you're out TDY and you have a, you know, a med refill and already I've had multiple pings this morning from people that are out of office um, that text message me or send me messages on Skype for things that they need wherever they're at. Um, and so we're here to help support that. I think one of the most difficult things from the med shop is as this organization has uh, become so successful and so large, how we meet a, a meaningful benefit to all these uh, units that are displaced simultaneously at many different locations. So one of the ways we've combated that is we have a uh, larger contingent of IDMTs that will help support out of office trainings uh, where there's high risk and in order to get them trained up to speed where they could meaningfully support and contribute to trainings that are already covered by PJs, uh, we put them through a fairly rigorous uh, trauma training pipeline uh, that's way more advanced 
and much beyond what you would get in big blue Air Force. From a sports medicine lane, uh, just keeping it uh, pretty focused on sports medicine here, uh, I'd be lying if the day-to-day uh, basics weren't the challenge here, the biggest challenge. Uh, to, to think that these are going to be simple issues, these are extremely high-functioning operators. Uh, just you know, physical specimens is a, a little bit uh, you know egregious to throw out there, but that's what we're working with. Um, and they've got a lot of unique uh, injuries, a lot of common ones too, but to think that you can get comfortable with your day-to-day basics, your fundamentals, um, I think the second you start getting comfortable, you should question uh, what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. But if I have to give you a, a pragmatic answer, uh, a, a real challenge that's not a cop-out for you, um, I would say the day-to-day continuity with those folks without having a front staff. Like we are our front staff, our team has to function, uh, and we rely on that regular communication. That should be a theme with the entire team discussion here today. Um, but we use our strength coaches uh, to be our eyes and ears in the gym. We speak with our dietitians regularly, uh, our ATs and PTs. When they're sitting down, they're getting some of the psych history, uh, and they're sending that to our psych providers. So uh, it's communication not just internally, but uh, externally with the other pillars. Awesome. Maria's going to have to leave early, so I want to give her the chance. We're going to throw questions out to the, the table, so I'd like her to ask a question for the group, and we'll go ahead and proceed to answering. What's the most important lesson that you've learned over your career within the unit that's made you successful here? From the command psych perspective or the HBO director <laughs> perspective, I think it's just being invasive. right? Like I think if we don't lean into people, they're not naturally going to seek out help, so I think uh, my first boss uh, in 2011 told me to just be invasive, and I think I took that and ran with it because you just need to be where they're at and continuously press them and follow up more than you ever would in any other job. Right? You wouldn't follow up with a no-show 10 times maybe at a clinic where you will do that here. And I think being invasive and showing you care is what's probably led to success. Far here. Three things come to mind for me. Uh, persistence, just following on, I think, what other people are going to say. Uh, the willingness every day to just come and uh, do do things that are uncomfortable and being persistent really gives you a lot of success here. I think um, <clears throat> humility allows you to grow and continue to grow and you know recognize your own strengths and weaknesses, which then helps you identify where on your team or within the unit those can be best applied and, and contribute and have the greatest impact. And lastly, and what I'm still learning is um, to have uh, to reach out to other people because there's so many talented people here in the unit. It's almost just like you really um, have to kind of search under every rock sometimes and you'll find pure gold. So uh, to do that practice early and often, consult with other people, the products tend to be uh, much better. Um, from the strength coaches, just I mean, this unit doesn't fail, and you'll quickly realize that when you get here, you can't be complacent. You always need to try to constantly strive and grow. And I know coming from baseball, 11 years, you really got just doing the same thing every day over and over, and it, you never grew as a, a person or as a professional. And coming here, they will give you every chance to succeed, whether it sends you to training, wherever you need, you will get what you need to succeed here. So you just got to just run with it, and you're going to run fast. Brian here from Med. Uh, to caveat onto that, your reach here, I've learned, is really only limited by your self-motivation. The organization as a whole is second to none in the amount of resources and creative ways they have to get to yes. And in so doing, this organization has actually grown in an you know, Air Force-wide no-growth environment. Um, but what I've learned specifically in MED is that the avenues to accomplish uh, what you didn't even seem possible in Big Blue are multifaceted, various, and really only limited by how much time you personally want to invest in that. And fortunately, this organization has a lot of people that are self-motivated and that want the best for their troops. So if you put forth the effort, there's going to be a lot of people behind you to accomplish what you need to do. So I've got a much shorter tenure here, but uh, one of the more important lessons to learn right off the bat is that your voice doesn't carry the most weight at every discussion at every table. Uh, especially on my team, we'll refer to it as the land of overlapping scopes. Uh, a lot of people speak very similar language, but they're slightly different. 
Um, so to sit down and come to a decision, uh, listening is hugely important. Um, and uh, you can't underestimate that. And that's listening to your own team, but then listening to the operators who have been here for 10 plus years. Uh, there's a lot to learn uh, from, from everybody here. So just drop an ego at the door, having a good dose of humility every day. Yeah, this has been, um, I think I'd uh, reiterate what Chad said about being invasive uh, from a psychological perspective. Um, I think sometimes you know, there is a stigma, um, especially from the performance realm where some things are seen as, as kind of wazoo and yeah, I think early on, just you know, trying to be everywhere all the time um, or make the appearance of that, um, I think was effective for me. Uh, being willing to, to talk to guys during training um, because that's really where the application of the field, uh, the, you know, the rubber meets the road there and helping them to find ways to apply the mental side and getting, getting them to realize that it's not wazoo at all. The mental side is always, always there all the time. And if you ignore it, you're probably um, ignoring something that can make you a whole lot better. And then really the last thing is, and this kind of ties back to the previous question about you know, the, the greatest problem. Um, if you ask me in two weeks what my greatest problem is, it's going to change, right? And so I think you know, just the, the ability of shifting from you know, one challenge to the next challenge to the next challenge, um, I think is one thing that pretty much everyone does here. And just realizing when the situation changes and the problem changes, then we have to be able to shift our focus as well. So for the different disciplines, what changes have you um, seen since you, this program began? And where do you see it going in the future? Command side position, I think the biggest change is that we've synchronized all those specialists into one team, um, which means we can mass for effect, right? So when I first got here, it was really a bunch of silos of excellence and everyone was doing disparate things. Uh, I think under uh, the previous commander and the follow-on commanders, we've synchronized HPO into a team of 55 professionals and three specialty pillars being psych, medical, and sports medicine. And I think that has been the ability to give us programmatics I think that's given us the ability to grow, and I think it gives us resources that no one else has, and I think that's gonna keep us on the cutting edge. Like I think right now, we have a cutting edge neurocognitive process. We have a cutting edge selection tools and both how we got to those attributes that we assess. And I think as long as we're a huge mass with the resources, but also nimbly in line with the units, we'll continue to be successful. From a sports medicine perspective, um, this isn't necessarily you know, uh, unique to this population. It's kind of Air Force wide, but chasing after uh, you know, all the predictive measures to, to be able to say you, you did this test this way and this is what that means going forward. And uh, instead of kind of chasing after that holy grail, we've kind of uh, gone back to the fundamentals of uh, if we're gonna do a test, if we're gonna do a baseline, uh, let's pick actionable information uh, that we can reproduce is as objective as you can get uh, and then tomorrow we're going to do something different because of that objective data. Uh, so we've started to do that and I would say in the future we would expand that uh, to you know continue to refine that so constantly uh, assessing are we doing the right stuff are we doing the right uh, set of uh, tests battery of metrics to follow uh, and just avoid doing uh, things just to collect the pile of data. Maria here. I, I think for me it's watching the evolution of people wanting to come to see to seek change and to be supported. Um, so now I, I can openly go for walks with people. We're no longer like hiding in a room somewhere and it's no longer this like oh you go see psych kind of scary thing. It's much more open and accepted and I think that that will become greater as our team evolves and as we get more people sitting in, in embedded roles within the units and I think that that's going to be welcome for people so they understand that they get to do their they will be able to do their job for a longer period of time by having that support. Yeah this has been I think um, so in 2017 when I got here you know, really, um, if you look at you know everything from the um, baselining program, uh, peak performance, uh, reset weeks, um, and then the transition program, I think it really illustrates a, a full spectrum of care and then really trying to get proactive um, before something becomes an issue. And uh, because of that, I think that um, um, you know, the individuals working here see HPO at consistent time points throughout their career, not just at like the very beginning and at the very end, but it's consistently across their time here. So I think they understand better how to utilize HPO. I um, mean, then just from a, an individual perspective, um, this, is, was, this was the first opportunity I had to actually work with a full psychological team. So I think that's important to put out because 
when I first came on board, I was housed underneath psychology. And because of that and all the different flavors of psychology, um, I've been able to work with you know, a neuroscientist, social workers, operational psychologist, clinical psychology, all the different entities, uh, and be able to really uh, come together on how you can work together and apply psychology to its highest level. Uh, Brian from Med over here, I would say that the changes that are most obvious that have uh, taken place um, is that our med shop is entirely new, updated with uh, state-of-the-art equipment that I can say, uh, after having toured facilities, um, really is superior to a lot of what our, our partner forces have. Um, also, uh, kind of caveating what others have said, is that we are no longer targeting operators in the last few years of their service as a time to intervene. Like We're seeking early intervention, and this is from day one when you get here. One of the big changes we've noticed over the last few years is that it's not just operators that need early intervention and prevention, it's also the direct support and ancillary support. So if you come to this unit, um, it's not just a handful of people that have access to medical resources, it's everyone, including medical staff. I just want to take a 25-year perspective of this question. And when I got here in 97, obviously we had one psych doc, we had a flight surgeon, we had one IDMT, and that was pretty much the sports staff. There was nobody, no strength coaches, obviously, or nothing. So really, when you came on board as an operator, it was how fast can you race to burn out? And then 9-11 kicked off, and then it just got worse and worse. Um, since this staff has come together and I've been here the entire time and watched the entire evolution, it is absolutely amazing from a guy who didn't have any of it, the guy who was doing beach muscles every day in the gym, pulling neck muscles, back was always torn because I was freaking lifting all the wrong ways. Watching what the operators get now and how these, this HBO team integrates from not even when they get assigned here, but even at selection when they're coming through, the HBO staff is integrated inside that process. The guys come here and it's instant integration with HPO all the way through to your time to exit the unit. So just an amazing, I wish I could put it in better words, but the evolution I've seen since 1997, uh, we should write a book about it because it's really been astronomical. All right, next question. Who's got one for the table? I do. What's the most effective way to get unit-wide buy-in for your position? Maria here. I think the most effective way to get unit buy-in is just being present and available and willing. And um, to answer text messages after hours and to, if someone asks for an appointment, always give one, you know, immediately closest to the, the question, right? And I think just being able to sit and learn from the guys in the space has also given me buy-in. So I used to sit in the debt with some of the, some of the older guys and some of the year, newer guys too, and they taught me a lot of the things that they had in their time here at the unit. And that also, that willingness to learn also got, gave me buy-in as well. Maria, how long did it take? Your position was new when it came on, so we were, that's odd to an operator, like do I want to open up or not? How long did it take for you to just sure. get into a good rhythm with people? I had, like people would ask me like questions in the break room, um, and I would just answer them honestly, and I think it maybe took four or five months before people really started to come to see me and it was more open. And I think also walking around with them and not seeing them in like an enclosed office was really helpful because everyone got to see, oh, she's also <laughs> talking to that person. So it really normalized it. it. It it happened a lot quicker than I anticipated it. I think it's important just to tag on that. Like you can see our two new hires with Carla and Celeste. That's even faster because of Maria's credibility in the unit. So. Everything does build off the credibility of everyone else here. And I think you're seeing, I used to always say it takes one year, which isn't as true now because people are just riding other people's coattails. I think that's a good feedback for both our providers and our hiring process. I would say from the strength coach lane, um, just be yourself. You know, if you come in and try to be somebody you're not, they're going to see right through that. Um, show them you care. Try to learn what they do because I had no military background at all. You just ask questions. Show them you care. Go on their training trips, see what they do, so you know what they're going through. If not, you have no way to relate to them. So if you show them that they care, they're going to start coming to you more and ask you questions. That's how you get that buy-in. John, what's the difference between now, 2022, and when you got here? Um, guys coming up to you wanting programming. I think um, from when I first got here, this program was just start getting off the ground. So you didn't have the guys coming here from different units having these resources. And guys coming here now have had strength coaches at the prior units, so they have a little more knowledge and they are um, 
more eager to come see you and ask for programming than before because before you're new and they they found everything before by going on the internet so they were self-taught whereas now they have coaches who teach them and get them ready for this next level i, I would also throw out that uh you know in addition to proximity and availability uh being able to make it relatable to what they're going into uh is a good way to get credibility or at least uh, get buy-in uh so if you're not speaking their language if you you know, if you're trying to get them back so they can walk with a backpack, uh, that sentence is uh, going to fall pretty flat. Uh, so making sure that you're speaking their language and understanding uh, that when they say their shoulder hurts, uh, why does that matter to what they're going to do tomorrow? Brian from Med, I would say that uh, in relation to our unit-wide buy-in, a lot of it's related to how good of a job we do as kind of a primary healthcare manager. And what that boils down to in a unit where we're geographically separated is that how good and reliable are our connections to the outside community and specialists should a unit member or their family uh, need a connection. And in order to orchestrate that, we have hired specific people uh, to build those relationships uh, and also manage our referrals one by one to ensure that things are not dropped. Uh, but also to caveat on what Maria and Chad have been saying is that a lot of it also comes down to if you say you're going to do something making sure you're doing it and following up and just being a good person, which the majority of the people here, in fact, I can't think of a single one, um, isn't here because they just want a title or a neat job. They sincerely care about their people on the force. And that kind of attitude is infectious. Barb, uh, from the upcycling, it is that proactive engagement with humility, I'll say, so constantly learning, but being proactive about the contribution you make to the organization. So getting uh, that exposure and building the relationships early on when people get here. So a few things we've done are um, like create a two-day in doc course so any new unit member gets full exposure to our command teams the mission and, our, and the history of our unit which i think gets buy-in immediately and then the second day they get full exposure to our hpo team they get a workout in the morning doesn't matter if they're a gs contractor active duty um, they're all invited to in doc so work out in the morning with hp they get to tour our facilities they get some individual investment and in that we uh, sit down with them and do like a, a review of their personality and iq instruments that they might have taken during their assessment and selection time and then we teach them something on that day as well we know the problems that people tend to face here and what we try to do is hit those up front so then you have a whole generation of people new to the unit but already speaking the right language and knowing the culture of prevention and and actually prepared uh for their time here so i think that is one of the ways that we get buy-in this has been um i was talking to lance our uh, hpa human performance advisor last week about this actually and uh you know one of our attributes is interpersonal effectiveness and i think that's uh one of the biggest ways I think all of us are um, naturally uh, gaining buy-in from um, all of the unit members here. Um, if, we, if we're not uh, good at that, um, tying back to what John said about just being ourselves and, and uh, being true to who we are, then we're probably going to lose them from the very get-go. And then, um, you know, lastly, from my position, um, I, I go on a lot of training trips, and it's one of those things where it's, it's almost like you're out of sight, out of mind. And so if you're there um, and you're available, then, man, they are going to ask you questions and they're going to pick your brain about things. So I think just being available um, you know, as much as possible is absolutely necessary here. Ben, from your position, what, what keeps some of the guys, maybe on OTC as they're integrating and hadn't really had access to you before, what keeps them from coming up to you, do you think, especially even on TDYs when you're available? No, no and, and this is, you know, historically a problem. Like if you look at, you know, the field, but there is a stigma and some guys, you know, they, they feel like, if they come up to a guy like me that they're um, admitting some kind of weakness, right, that they can't handle on, on their own. And honestly, in an OTC setting, then they worry about, you know, what other guys think about them that they're on team with um, or the instructors, right? And so um, although, honestly, I, I would you know, say that most of the time there's really not a whole lot on those guys' minds. It, it's just a perception that they hold. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, that that's one of the biggest things that holds guys up initially. Um, but there are times where, and, and that's why I try to remain as approachable as possible, I'll still go up to those guys and so try to make it like, hey, this is just a normal part of, of how we, or how I actually operate it, uh, from my position, so it uh, opens them up a little bit more later on, potentially. 
trip. If I could jump in there too, like we also put a clinical social worker with OTC to differ differentiate Ben's role and operational psychologist to do that dispositional recommendation. So we try to keep Ben clean enough that he is purely consultation for performance and staying in OTC. I think we owe them a better job this year because we'll have all three assets hired. Uh, but the goal is to keep three specialists there that do three different things so Ben can be seen as solely performance and use Ben to stay in OTC. And from the strength coaches and that performance aspect, during the early workouts with the OTC guys get here, we incorporate Ben in our workouts to show him, hey, this is what he can offer you guys, and he's in there every workout doing different drills with them. All right, next question for the table. So um, I'll try not to direct this solely at Chad, um, but I guess maybe uh, to Chad first. What's the hardest part of uh, keeping 50 plus people uh, on the same page? How do you get 50 plus people to move in the same direction? I think the hardest part is the natural resistance to be repetitive, right? Like I probably say the same things 400 times in a month, but I think as humans, we like to think that we don't have to do that. So I think I have to constantly remind myself that to keep us all synchronized on the same narrative, I really am that chief reminding officer that's going to remind people that we are making better decisions with the three of us and the 55 people together. I think also is just the trust in Brian and Wes to do your jobs. And I don't have to get down in your weeds, right? So if we hire selectively and you guys do your jobs well, then I can focus on that reminding uh, and you guys can keep me in check, but you can also run your pillars like I run my pillars. So I think it's those two things, delegating effectively, but not advocating responsibility and being a chief reminding officer for everything we find important. Brian here, if I could weigh in uh, to also clarify the question. It's not necessarily 50 operators moving in the same direction. He's talking specifically when the HPO organization, all of us, sports med, psych, and med included. Um, I would caveat here in this organization, unlike a lot of others I've been at, there really is a top-down leadership approach, and you will not see anyone working harder in this organization than Wes or Chad, and they're at the, the peaks of their pillars. And I'm, the newest one here, and so I hope that I can put forth uh, as much obvious effort and success as they have been able to do. But I think a lot of the culture stems down from what they've already put forth and what drives them. Just being a member of the team um, uh, and, and understanding how uh, we're treated as uh, uh, contractors. In this case, you know, we have um, HPO offsites, you know, um, regularly so it keeps all of us on the same page and we have team off sites regularly to keep us all, all on the same page and then from the individual perspective i have you know between three and five priorities every six months and i know exactly how those priorities align to uh, hpo's efforts um, and so i think that's one of the the biggest things that um, i've seen lacking in some of the other areas that i've worked in that really keeps us all on the same page or it keeps keeps us all um, synchronized if you will all right, I'm going to take the next question because I'm really interested in this one. So biggest obstacle and constraint. So the way I want to frame this in our minds right now is you're on the outside looking in saying, I might want to come up and join the HPO team. Or maybe I'm an operator that wants to come up. What's your biggest obstacle and constraint that you have to deal with on a daily basis that um, you're having to work and navigate around to do your job? So this is Barb. I'll just speak personally. Uh, one of the constraints I have heard from folks who are thinking about applying is this uh, prioritization of you know their work and their life and how that might look. So people, for example, who professionals who also have families worry that they won't be able to contribute enough. And my answer to that is um, that you absolutely will. There is a way to contribute effectively from your position and. Um, take time for your family. So I think we've reached a really healthy, I'll never call it balance, um, but just realization of what it takes to keep people running hard for a really long time. And so the culture here is one that isn't chasing after every little task that may be unimportant, but chasing really hard after the important tasks, which allows you to also be very bold about the time that you use to protect your family. I think from the command um, psychology position, looking from the outside, looking to come in, is I think we lose a lot of applicants based on some pretty rigid written performance work statements, and I think people self-select out. Uh, I think if people would just apply if they're interested in the job, we can get to yes a lot of the times. And I think we've had 
Uh, we've been pretty successful for waivers in the psych pillar specifically, occasionally with the sports medicine positions. Um, but I would just say if you're interested in the job, apply, because if you never put your name out there, we can't use our networks and leverages to get people here. And I think we're losing lots of applicants based on PDF, PWS's performance work statements that were written by people that don't do the jobs. Brian here from Med. Um, I think the biggest constraint for medical providers looking to come into the unit is unfortunately we have to maintain a certain amount of anonymity as well as silence regarding a lot of the taskings and missions that we touch here, which I think is probably the main reason why this podcast is so useful is we're able to talk about certain things, frankly, um, while not divulging important things. But what makes that very difficult is that you look at jobs on the outside uh, and Chad has alluded to this, uh, there's a lot of jobs right now that are paying very well for psychologists and doctors. But what you don't see is um, those providers are still getting burnt out and they're still looking for purpose in their lives. And although we can't tell you all of the missions and purposes that you'll touch here, I can promise you that there is no job in the civilian sector that's even close to what you're going to have as an impact. But on the other side of the coin is that when you come here as a medical provider, you're not just another guy running a shift and you're not, we're not tracking your RVUs. What we're looking at um, is we're looking at you as a team player and we want you functioning at your highest level too. So I think our hardest job here as a recruiting agency for other docs is relaying that information. From a constraint standpoint, I think I'd even say the lack of constraint. Uh, so uh, there's a ton of flexibility in your day to day. Uh, the hardest question to answer for us is what your normal day look like. That just doesn't exist. Um, and you would think from a, you know, a, a doctor standpoint, it's just people come from a clinic and that would, would drive them crazy. But it could be said for everybody on our sports medicine team, there's an off season and an in season for almost all sports. Uh, we have a full season that's just <laughs> steady go. Um, so. Uh, you have to be able to work around that and stay sane during that while still providing that high quality product. For my colleagues around the table, my question would be what is the most common feedback you get from the people that you serve here, whether it be operator or support? I think from the strength coach perspective, especially coming from us that came from college and professional sports, those guys there are not grateful at all. And the guys we deal with now are very grateful for anything we do for them. Um, whether it be read a program, just talk to them like a normal human being, they just appreciate just acting like a normal person around them, whereas in professional sports, they're just, they're there, they're like, okay, yeah, whatever, and they don't even care or thank you for what you do. So I think just the fact that they appreciate what we do and, and they, they'll th th thank you every day and whatever you do with them. So that's that means a lot. From the command site position, it's really um, consistently how available our team is, right? So I think most people here understand that whatever you need, wherever you are, our team will respond, and I think they appreciate that. And I think it's the most consistent feedback I get about everyone. Barb here. So some of the feedback I've received uh, really in regards to our whole HPO team, and I'm including Trey on this one, is some of our touch points are in addition to what's absolutely necessary or critical. So it is above and beyond. We're taking extra time, extra research to plug in and help individuals grow to be better human beings and better, you know, operators or, you know, insert whatever AFSC. And so some of the feedback we've received is that no one else is doing this. I wish I would have had this earlier. And this um, is exciting because it's why they came here. You know, they came here for the challenge and they came to, to grow. And we're giving them additional opportunities that they didn't expect. I think just in, just in regards, this has been, I think just in regards to feedback um, in general, I think uh, the unit has a um, has established a culture of feedback, um, and I think that you know certainly happens on the HPO team. Um, it happens during you know operator ANS uh, when guys are already uh, given uh, peer feedback throughout the process, and um, I think because um, the feedback process starts so early, the culture of feedback um, continues to proceed throughout um, people's time here. And I think because of that, people will tell you that they really enjoy actually getting feedback so that they know, you know where they stand, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and how to improve their, their overall performance in their, their positions. Brian here from Med. Uh, 
although what everyone else has said is true, I'm trying not to repeat what they've said, but I definitely uh, would add on the coattails of the humility and gratitude that we get on a day-to-day -day basis, which is just uh, astounding when you work with some of the nation's best. Um, but I would say the second most common feedback that we get is a healthy ask. Um, we're asked to be part of a lot of different operations uh, that were not requiring med and psych in the past, but because uh, we have had such a pivotal role and other things that have happened in this unit, um, there's more and more added to our plates uh, to ask if we can support and be there. So there's an ever-growing need for us to be present and having a seat at these tables is really a blessing. I have a question for you, Wes. Since you're the only sports medicine position we have in special tactics right now, if you could just give us what unique capabilities you bring to our organization as a primary care sports medicine doctor. I, I guess I would try to downplay the the single person uh, of it. You know, I think as a, as a role, you can really synthesize all those different languages we talked about on that sports medicine team. I'm definitely not a strength coach, I'm definitely not a PT or an AT uh, or a dietitian, um, but I can synthesize some of that language and try to get us all on the same sheet of music. So that would be the internal team that sports medicine is going to bring, so synthesizing that kind of uh, you know, smaller team. But then being able to crosstalk with the, the medical pillar, with your traditional medical uh, personnel, your PAs, your IDMTs, uh, with Brian as the SG. Um, being able to cross that lane, that, that tends to be a lane in other settings where it's kind of hard to bridge. The, the languages are fairly disparate. So I think that's probably one of the bigger things. And I'm neglecting the psych lane because I'm talking uh, right to chat on this answer. But uh, it, same, same can be said with the psych pillar. Um, but I, I do think the biggest benefit is probably just somebody that can help synchronize. Um, I mean, it would be a whole separate uh, discussion that would be primarily just for me uh, on what other skills to bring to the table, but um, we're trying to expand our scope constantly. Um, so from a procedural standpoint, definitely uh, having all the in-house capabilities that a normal traditional sports medicine clinic would have, uh, we're trying to own that in-house, and there's a lot of support to do that. Um, so just that would be the one, you know, me thing that I bring to the table. I think just to add to that, because he's a little too humble in that answer, like we were given one position and could have made it anything, and we chose to make it a sports medicine doc for that unique capability. And I think just from the outside, the things that we hear is the ability to do injections in-house, to do ultrasounds in-house, to find like a mechanism of what the injury is and focus on that rather than just plug and play and treat uh, the symptoms of things. I think the guys appreciate that. So I think it does give us a more robust synchronization of those sports med positions. Uh, but also it gives us this expertise that we've never had in-house. Uh, and I think the guys are talking about it, and they don't talk about anything lightly. So I think, not to answer for Wes, but I think your humility didn't highlight your capabilities. I got a question for the group. Um, when we have guys that are pulled from no-notice deployments while dinner is still hot on the stove, how are you supporting their families? I think from, from the command side perspective, depending on what unit that um, – movement came from, the first thing the social worker that's aligned with that organization will do is reach out to the family member just to make sure that they have their contact number, they know who they can reach out to, um, and, and when and how to get a hold of them. That is de-conflicted with both the troop chief and the, and the flight chief and the first sergeant, but most of the times we're going to make sure they have that redundant message from, again, the troop, the, the first sergeant, and then the clinical provider aligned with that. So. They know if they have a worry and whatever that is, they can. A lot of times, Katie, uh, your nurse case manager, will also reach out, uh, particularly if there's a known problem with that family. I'll add to from um, that side of the house. One of the things that we feed to every single incoming spouse on their um, internal spouse brief that they get um, when their husband is brought into the unit um, is a dock on call phone should an emergency happen. And basically, our hands are limited in terms of what medical capability we can provide to non military people, but we're absolutely a support um, as well as a consultant. So um, we'll get calls. This phone's monitored 24 7, 365. And should you be deployed and your spouse is at home and has kids that are sick in the middle of the night, she can call this number and ask, hey, is this something I need to go to the ER about? What would you do about this? I had a fall. I had a trauma. Um, what would you recommend? What can you offer? Um, and we're monitoring that phone 
not only for alerts that can come at any given point for med support, but also for families, because we care about your family if you head out. Ben, I'm going to ask you a similar question I asked for Wes, because you're the only sports psychologist in special tactics. Uh, I would just ask you to talk about what unique capabilities that only you can bring to our team, um, particularly since we have seven other psychology specialists on our team. So I, th I think what probably makes me unique is um, I don't have a counseling or a clinical background at all, depending on you know, what program you, you go to in your, in your master's or PhD programs, you might get that training. I did not. I'm really more of a human performance slash kinesiology based um, application of sport and performance psychology um, approach. And because of that, um, I have a, a strong emphasis in improving uh, human performance, human skill acquisition, and then applying it from a, from a coaching standpoint as well, um, which is essentially why I work so much with uh, instructors and cadre here. Um, the other thing I think that's um, been a, a beneficial part of my background to bring is I have my uh, CSCS, so Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, um, and I'm also certified in HRV biofeedback training. So um, because of that, I've been able to apply um, psychophysiological principles. I've been able to, to uh, synchronize with uh, uh, HPE quite a bit um, and integrate into uh, the, uh, those realms, specifically integrating mental training into a uh, physical performance realm. And uh, yeah, I think that's how I would answer that. Operator comes to you personally with a problem, then yours is easy, like an OTC, they're having a problem. How have y'all worked with that person to solve the problem and really just trying to build um, identity or trying to build awareness to the outside community of, of what we're doing for them when they come up here? I'll go from the strength coach lane. Um, most of the time, we are the first line of defense, so to speak. Uh, we see them probably the most out of any of the disciplines. Um, so we usually have a very good relationship with these guys. So if something comes up, they'll probably tell us first. So the way I handle it is usually talk to them, um, see what's going on, see if we can help. And if not, we will obviously refer them to a specialty that can help them more than needs if they need it. But the key, going back to what we talked about, is just you need to be friends with these guys and need to trust you. So you got to show them that you care, and they will come talk to you this, and then that's the first line to get them the help they need. From the command side position, I think it's just leveraging the holistic nature of our teams. Like there's very few problems that are unilaterally psych, medical, or musculoskeletal here, right? So if we just use a easy jump injury, right, that might be Wes as the first contact because they have a broken femur. Uh, but pretty quickly, they're going to have some depression or anger because they're not doing the job they came here to do. Uh, and then they're going to be back with Brian, figuring out how fast they can get on status and when they get that waiver done. So if your initial contact, you can figure out what the problem is and then lay out the routine and kind of the, the touch points that we need to do. And the by name person that's going to walk you through that, you get buy-in for the whole process, which means their motivation to work with Wes's team, Brian's team, and our psych team is higher. So I think showing them all the cards in the very beginning, show them how we're synchronizing, how that will get them back on the X faster. Um, is probably what we do for every single problem, no matter which one of these specialties it is. And, and I will reiterate, I don't think any problem we have is unilateral to the specific pillar. They're complex. Brian here from Med. So I would say what might be a little bit different from other med shops is we are not in the business of keeping guys down if they have some risk on the table for a medical condition. We're in the business of keeping guys up in the air. So I think what that affords is a unique aspect of honesty that you'll have with your med providers, whether it's uh, your doc or your sports med uh, trainer or your sports med doc or your psychologist. You can speak frankly and you can help tailor the medicine towards your needs. So an example, if you have something that happens that there may be a medicine uh, that could help you, we'll uh, go over different courses of action uh, that may or may not ground you from flight. And so we can talk about those. Um, as a doc, I never dictate what needs to be done with my members. A lot of the medical care that we do is in, in shared decision making to keep guys up as uh, soon as possible um, while also balancing their medical needs. And the way we integrate that with the other team is we have a very open stream of communication among all the pillars, uh, psych, med, sports med, but also command uh, from the earliest get-go. Um, as soon as there's an issue, command is tracking it to get their guy back up to speed as soon as possible. So this is redundant at this point, but uh, uh, it really is uh, using every interaction as a sounding board to message the services we have here. Uh, and you kind of piggyback off the trust that they had on the first person that they saw, uh, whether that's our strength coach or our AT or psych or another med provider. Um, but if that person is aware as a provider to say, hey, 
We have these several other flavors of folks that you can see for this problem, uh, or a problem because of this problem, as Chad alluded to. Uh, that's, I think that's how we uh, make sure that everybody is aware and utilizing all the different uh, types of support we can provide. To follow up on that, as like most of us, all of us will always follow up with the provider and make sure they're getting seen and take care of it just to, so we're not just dumping them off and forgetting about it. We always will follow up to make sure they're getting the care they need. Um, if, if a guy comes to me uh, at training, for example, it's a TDY trip and he comes to me with a problem, um, you know, my first step um, is usually going to be to try to um, air detect and correct, um, try to get down to the root cause or causes uh, of what's happening um, and try to um, apply certain principles as quickly as we can because usually it, it's in the training environment usually there's going to be another iteration to complete um, within a few minutes most of the time so we're going to try to do um, some uh, quick patchwork right there um, I say quick patchwork because usually um, it is quick but it, it also ties back to what's most of the time been done in peak performance as well as some other trainings um, I'm also going to get um, with the instructors um, because maybe it's something that I can't um, do anything about at all, but the instructors have a lot of power over it. So I'll, I'll work uh, by, with, and through the instructors to try to help them um, help that individual in the training environment. Um, and then um, with that being said, if the uh, underlying causes and, and are even deeper than, uh, like you know, Chad mentioned before, we have a full uh, psychological staff that if it falls outside my lane of effort, then um, we have direct contacts, and I know exactly the referral process for how to get the guy um, all the help he actually needs to, to succeed in that training environment. Okay, question for the table. How do you feel like your specific role touches the mission directly? I mean, this, from a sports medicine perspective, this is about as uh, good of a spot as you can get for touching the mission. I mean, uh, we're speeding pretty quick with getting people back um, because the mission uh, demands it. Uh, we have a select number of people that do a very specific number of jobs. Um, so we will get people back quicker than you, you would ever imagine. Uh, uh, and to see a person in your office and then to hear that they're out of country doing their job uh, the following week uh, after, for example, this is a real example, breaking their clavicle uh, and having it surgically fixed. We clearly didn't do the surgery in-house, I should point that out. Um, but the fact that our rehab team was able to get them out there um, like shortly after, four to six weeks after uh, breaking that clavicle, um, that's big. Uh, and it's really impactful to our team. And I also think word of mouth to the operators as well to know that hey, there were a lot of people involved uh, to get you back out there. Barb, so uh, one way the op psych impacts the mission here is, you know, through the hiring process and being able to consult um, with the hiring authority on risk and potential for every individual, for every AFSC. So I think there's a direct connection there. And addition, additionally to that, uh, trying to prevent and prepare as soon as the individual gets here so they can be fully available for whatever they're called to do and then being there knowing who's gone and being available for them so plenty of guys reach back through you know skype while deployed to some with more kind of family issues some with more kind of personal issues that are affecting their performance be it like um you know mindset or things like that so i think those are a few ways that this role directly impacts the mission i think to add to that from the command side position is uh, in conjunction with the command, because I think that gives us a lot of credibility. Um, when guys come back from, say, short notice uh, operational mission, like they are required to sit down with us again, and we can help them make sure that they reintegrate back quickly. And I think it's just good to do that AAR with them, make sure they have what they have, and get them back on their CTO. But you're touching people literally sometimes hours when they get back in a country that is a good application closest to when they are going to be receiving your skill set um, and making sure that they can continue to do the job. I think from a strength coach perspective, it's obviously a very physically demanding job. Um, so our, one of our main focus is to keep them all around ready to go because we never know if they're going to have to walk in 15 miles or whatever, run. So we just try to keep them well rounded as possible unless if they know specifically what they're going to do. Um, so it's always nice to hear, hey, man, I feel great. I feel awesome. You know, come back and no problems. Or if they come back, they'll get feedback. Hey, we need to train more of this. 
So we're constantly talking to them and find out what they need on the end because we don't know that haven't ever you know done what they've done. So we're always constantly asking for feedback on what they need. I think uh, you know from my perspective, uh, just um, realizing that no matter what course uh, the guys are going through here, um, uh, males and females actually in this case, they um, they're going through an extremely high level of training and to be able to um, help them achieve their um, upper potential in those courses from a mental standpoint. Um, and then some of those folks, uh, you know, graduating and then immediately going out the door. Um, I think that's, you know, some of the biggest impacts I could have for the, the operational environment is to, to try to facilitate that through the training environment as much as possible. So they're as ready as possible. Who's going to struggle? So if, if folks are in these specialties out there listening and saying, hey, that sounds pretty cool. We talked about a lot of positive things, but who would be some folks that might struggle when they get thrown inside this environment? I would say um, people who aren't willing to learn and, and develop themselves. If you just think you know it all, you're going to fail. Because these guys here are, are really smart, and they're going to ask the questions that are going to challenge you. And if you don't seek the answer or have the answers, you're not going to be able to succeed here. I think historically, it's from the command site position, it's three things. One is just patience, right? Like no one here comes in with trust given. Like trust has to be earned. I do think we're making that faster, but I think we hire people that have been successful their whole lives. They're usually at the top of their game, and then we say slow down for a year till people trust you. And I think people always say, because we give them this in brief at selection, that they're good with that, but watching people struggle with it is very challenging for people. I think the second thing is everyone says they want to do synchronized care because it's a buzzword now. Embedded synchronized care is the new rage, right, or the new heat. And I think it takes special people to really do that. It takes special people for physician, two physicians to slow down and bring in a psychologist to decisions that could be 98% medical. Or for Brian and Wes to come off task and come over to me for a case that is purely an alcohol dependence case that they have a little bit of insight in the beginning. Uh, but to slow down and do that so we're making good decisions um, everyone says they want to do that, but uh, it's not true. Like, I think it takes special people to do that. Then I think, uh, you know, the, the old adage of support versus supporting. Brian's an ER doc. Like, if he's in an ER shift, he's got 26 people handing him a scalpel. He's got zero people handing him his gloves right now, right? So I think, like, when I was my first year in an MTF, I had 25 techs that worked for me. Now I have one tech that works for me, but we really have her doing couples counseling. So. I think if you don't fully come here knowing you're not the supported element, though everywhere else you work, you've been the supported element, um, you can struggle significantly. I think from a, uh, from a SME perspective, um, I think uh, people who aren't willing to put themselves out there and um, demonstrate to some level um, to uh, all the different entities here what their capabilities are. Um, so for example, when I came on board, I, not many people knew what sport performance psychology could do. And so I was tasked with one time per month, uh, I needed to do a storyboard. And honestly, that was really effective guidance um, because it was, it was a format that could be used as a way to publicize what the position does and how it's actually being integrated into the unit um, so that those capabilities were realized. So I think, you know, from my perspective, I think people who have been unsuccessful here were the ones who were you know, more stuck in like a cubicle or stuck in an office and not willing to put themselves out there um, so the people um, in the unit know what they can actually bring to the fight. This is Brian from Med. Um, I'd like to focus on probably two elements that make it difficult to work here if you want them. So one would be predictability and the other is uh, clear leadership lines. So. Here we have multiple assets that are all high functioning. And so if you look at it from a leadership breakdown, we have up to maybe 15 bosses um, that all think um, they need us immediately at that moment. And in truth, the missions are all important. And so you just have to learn how to simultaneously balance multiple things at once and not just one line of authority. Also, there's not a clear amount of predictability of this job. And so you have to maintain a certain degree of flexibility. Sure, if I could add one thing too, I think you just have to not care who gets the credit and then realize that none of us can do this alone. Like I can get most of our key touch points, right? Like we wouldn't have a reset week if it wasn't for Matt, right? And he saw a problem as an operator and then asked for our help that we were able to deliver. If you didn't bring us into selection and or peak, like we wouldn't have that. If we didn't, we wouldn't even do an extension process if it wasn't for an operator saying, hey, there's a problem here. Should we be keeping these people here? So I think 
we have to realize it's not just HPO bodies that us, makes us successful and then and be okay with that because it's true, but it also makes us better. Like we're better because we're synchronized with the operational force that sees a requirement that only we can fill. And I think too many people want the credit when the credit's irrelevant. Uh, it's really what matters that the guys can go do the job we ask them to do. I got, I got one more question that's killing me. It's been killing me since I have turned into a civilian and, and got to integrate with a bunch of PhD holders and smart folks inside the HP staff. And I think you folks do this better than any other people in the performance realm that I've seen outside, whether it's in sports or other agencies. A lot of people with PhDs wait for research to catch up before they want to issue out tips and guidance and here's something that you could try. Y'all seem to balance in almost every one of your modalities, y'all seem to balance that risk a little bit better than most. We're saying, hey, research isn't caught up necessarily to where where we want to be with it, but here's what it's telling us right now. How do y'all apply that in your daily lives as you're dealing with operators and trying to increase their performance? Sure, I think from the command side perspective, it is a like research should be driven by the problem on the ground, right? And the guy on the ground knows the problem faster than any research scientist will. And I think I think it's okay if someone sees a problem and we offer a solution, as long as we have the ability to validate that solution in the in the in the background and i think that's probably what drives all of us right like we are driven by the operator on the ground regardless of how you define operator they're seeing problems that never exist anymore so like for example if we talk about one of our mission sets we put different afses on the ground and they're different problems right and we have to solve them differently than we have for operators of the zulu nature for 20 years and i think if we just took the research that was already there uh, or we're unwilling to try new things with those people, we wouldn't be solving those problems in real time. So I think it's the ability to meet the guy on the ground and solve problems at real time, and then have a willingness of the command that collects data, validates, and then changes what we're doing is what really, I think, at least for me, drives to take those risks in the middle. From a sports medicine line, uh, I think it's, there's a lot of shiny toys. We talked about this a little bit already. Um, and it's I, I don't want to separate the two and say that all the shiny toys are the things without evidence. Or uh, if we're taking a risk with something, uh, there's not an uh, intentional way that we're taking a risk with it. We're going to use the best available evidence out there, number one. So if there isn't best available evidence out there for a device, a procedure, um, a, you know, a treatment plan, I think we talk internally about the risks and benefits. And if it's a very little risk, not just saying risk to the operator, but cost, time, interference with the mission. If it's a relatively low risk procedure that has the potential for benefit, I don't see us not trying to go after one or two of those initiatives. A low percentage of our time, but uh, some percentage of our time we're going after that in a way that will allow us to say, I want to capture these metrics up front uh, in a deliberate fashion. So on the back end, we can say, was it worth it? So it just doesn't turn into, well, this is what we always do here. Uh, and uh, we, we never stop to truly appreciate what is the newest evidence that we just generated. Brian here from Med. Uh, one of the mantras that kind of echo in my mind regarding this is that progress is only progress if you're moving in the right direction. And so although we're at the forefront and knife's edge on certain medical treatments, um, we're also looking at that background data that Chad talked about. One of the things that we're doing right now is we're looking at uh, mobile uh, magnetic resonance treatment therapy. So guys don't even have to be at a MERT machine, which is a magnetic uh, resonance treatment uh, for PTSD, uh, depression, uh, sleep disturbance. Uh, we've uh, validated uh, on the road machines. So. Our guys that are out and about 200 days a year can still get this top of the line treatment that's still under phase two trials right now. So it's not even available at most premier academic institutions, but we have it here. And I would say that our population is different from, you know, a lot of the research studies are done on populations that are very different in both age, health, and experience, um, not to mention like the complex sim symptoms. So it would be unwise of us to base everything on, you know, those kind of traditional research studies, knowing that our population is, is so different. And so I think something that we've been able to do is, you know, as Wes said, take some of those risks, but also track them just specific to our population so that we know, for example, uh, if a guy is falling asleep 
okay, but he's not staying asleep, which is a large problem here. Um, we've tried out these chili pads, which are like a cooled weighted blanket, and we're finding huge success just with that specific symptom of them being able to stay asleep longer, which then is unbelievably um, impactful to their mood and their motivation the following day. I think from a strength coach perspective, um, there's so many new technology and toys that always are coming out. Um, so you can't, you have to try some of it, but we do a good job with our staff, but we'll try it with our staff first. And then we always have a few um, willing operators that are willing to um, give us, you know, real world feedback on what they thought of it. So we're not just throwing it out there to the masses and wasting money. We'll try it out. We'll get a demo of it and see if it works or not. And so we go through it that, that way first before we just dive head first into something without actually testing it ourselves or on the end user. I think, um, too, you know, a lot of the folks up here are literally looking for another 1% to 2%. Um, and because they're looking for that 1% to 2%, they're willing to try a, a lot of different things. Um, there was an example three years ago where a guy came to me and we had a piece of technology and he wanted to apply it um, or take it and use it in one way. And I was like, well, honestly, most of the research is pointing to the fact that it's not saying it actually does that. And so then, you know, I think, you know, my role there was to, I'm not the expert in that field, but I did reach out to the expert in the field to find out, okay, we have this tech, how can we most effectively apply it? Uh, and then provide that guy with the uh, necessary guidance he needed to use, you know, in this case, a piece of technology to do something that might be a little bit more um, uh, reachable in terms of his intent than what some of the uh, uh, purported benefits have been put out to be. So Maria, um, round us out, we're gonna go ahead and um, Send the last question out to the table. So if you would, please lead us. What are some experiences that have kept you here at the unit? I would say from the strength coach perspective is um, having a guy coming back from a pretty serious injury, um, whether it be downrange or training, and just working with them. I mean, we from the day they're injured, we go to their house the day after surgery, whatever we'll do, and just seeing them get back to status is a real rewarding experience, um, something that you don't see anywhere else. And just to see them back in action is, is Pretty amazing. I think from the command site position, I would, I would probably say three things for this place. I think one is just the amount that we care, and I think you can look at a terrible event like Pete Pete Crane's death, and like the ability for this organization to synchronize from our team going to the next akin with Emily, to then doing the unit notification the next day, to send in Maria, you, uh, and our other providers out even to Idaho and everywhere else to mass on those people, and a follow up for a month month long to year long support. Um, just shows you how much the team gets together and coalesces over hard events. And I think that that is why uh, I've probably stayed in special tactics that long. I think too, is just our investment in getting better. Like just selection wise, we've invested about $1.5 million and it wasn't just a psych thing. Like we got to work with Trey, like Trey's in all of our Raider videos, right? Because he was bought into the process. We had 50 different AFSCs across the unit come together. So a team wide effort to improve how we hire people. I think just the team nature of our HPO team, like we do have a very good team of people that want to work together and that's motivating to come here and makes you want to come back just to be better for the team. Brian from Med. So I, I think uh, the nice global overarching goal is definitely the mission, but uh, the day to day uh, is usually sometimes <laughs> the most impactful for keeping people here. And for me, one of the most powerful things that I was a part of and witnessed um, was uh, the memorial workouts we do for our fallen comrades and in the recent past we've had three of them and it's not just operators that are coming together to honor these fallen members it's a support crew it's tech um, it's uh, is people uh, that are all coming out and uh, getting under the sun uh, getting a sweat on and with every foot they put forth they commemorate remember the steps of those that can't put feet forth anymore and honor their families that are left behind and it's not just once a year that we do a memorial workout. It's not just the MRF. It's all the time for members that have touched this unit. And to come together is the most military thing I can imagine. And it, it's a bummer that not more units are doing it like that. I think for me, like I had a case where uh, a patient passed away and I got to do the next of kin. And in that experience, I got to support his family in their, their worst day, right? but I also was supported by my team. 
And that's a unique experience that I don't know if I would have gone anywhere else, but to be completely in, engulfed in compassion and care while I was providing that for his family. And that's something that keeps me here is the team and the people that I get to help in their moments of need because they might not know where to go and I can walk alongside them as they take that journey. And that's, that's remarkable and it's something that you don't really find anywhere else. I'm personally just super excited anytime anyone gets to go out the door and I think we're going out the door more than um, most units out there and that can't be undersold uh, how much we're doing to impact the world right now so I'm just excited to be here and even if I haven't you know had a personal relationship with that person in addition to that I think you know our operators um, assessment selection process the last event is always extremely motivating to me because you get to see people who not really even knowing specifically what they might be getting themselves into are willing to put everything they have into uh, serving and that's just I think a unique thing in again just globally I think to be around a whole group of people that are willing to put themselves out so much just to serve our nation and whatever it calls them to do uh, is really exciting every time I get to experience it. I think uh, this has been, uh, because my primary line of effort here is OTC, I think, you know, just uh, the ability to um, work with a group of guys, uh, you know, seeing them in ANS, seeing them in peak performance, and then working with them throughout the um, duration of their course, um, the guys going through it, as well as the guys doing the, the training, um, that's very rewarding for me. Um, and it's uh, it's what just keeps me coming back. From a sports med perspective, I mean, it's really easy uh, to keep coming back to work because you see people coming in motivated to get better every day. Uh, like you don't get that in a normal setting. Like that that is not your normal sports med clinic. Uh, anybody listening knows that. Um, but to see somebody with a, a terrible injury that you think is going to take you know a full year to get back from, to see them go and do something for our country. Uh, within a couple months, um, that's hugely impactful. Um, that that means a lot to everybody on the team. I know probably everybody could say a similar version of that story, uh, but from sports med, that's what I value most uh, every day. So we're going to go around the table one more time for final words. John, we're going to start with you. We're going to end with Chad. I would just say um, working here, it really, you know, people always say we're a family, but you really are a family here. You even hear from the, the active duty members, like you're one of us. Um, they always try to incorporate us into anything they're doing, and that means a lot. And especially like Maria said earlier, with our staff, we we are taken care of just like the other guys. If we have a problem, they'll put down everything they're doing and come help us out. You know, you know, Chad's always, hey, you okay? You need anything? So always checking up on us. So that means a lot that we're considered part of the family, not just you know some outsider giving the support. Yeah, I think for for me, just um, the. Uh, Daily knowledge is that you come in with a set of priorities, um, and those priorities are aligned to a lot of the things that you're going to want to do anyway, um, and then being able to apply them effectively throughout uh, your time here uh, to try and to uh, help the unit members here to achieve just the, the highest level of performance they possibly can, and that that's contributing to their mission. It's super impactful, and then just realizing, too, that there, there's really not you know too many people that I've run into here at all that are not willing at accepting of what you have to offer um, if, you, if you're able to um, tell them what you can do and what you can uh, help them with. So um, very, uh, uh, it's just a great place to be in terms of all of that. Yeah, I would say it's been an interesting couple of years just for the world. So even amidst you know the drawdown in Afghanistan and a lot of the military folks being back home um, and essentially, you know, I guess hypothetically twiddling their thumbs, although I know they're not doing that, uh, in addition to COVID, uh, I have heard, I can't even tell you how many times that people say, like, this is still the best place to be. You know, we're still doing more than probably what's happening in other places, and we're working with the best people. So I just have to echo their comments. From an active duty person at the table, uh, you feel extremely fortunate uh, to get this job, to come here and just assess alone, uh, to get the job, uh, even more gratitude. And then you realize this is a very challenging job when you get here. Uh, I saw some chuckles at the table. Um, it, it is a grind, but 
you find those things that are rewarding, which come more frequent than not. Uh, and that's what keeps you going when you're here. Uh, and then when you get the chance to bring somebody else onto your team and show them, whether they're civilian or active duty, to show them how special this mission set is and how special this teamwork is here, uh, that's really what drives it home. So uh, all around fantastic place to be. Brian here at MED. Uh, this is kind of an echo from what you've heard, um, but I'd like to emphasize community in general here. Um, you can work anywhere from 9 to 3 or 9 to 4 every day um, and be miserable if the community there is miserable and burnt out and uh, don't really have a focus on tomorrow other than, oh, I don't know when we'll be there to make money. And as soon as 4 o'clock hits, I'm home. Uh, here you're you're as strong as your community is, and it's as iron sharpens iron. The people that want to be here and the attitudes that they bring are infectious. And so when you're staying late on these trainings or these exercises, um, it doesn't feel like an obligation. It really feels like a privilege. And there's not a day that goes by that you'll question, like, am I doing something that's worthwhile? Because you get that answer, like, handed to you every single day when a TS communication comes down and, and your team is on it and you're touching the world. I think I've never worked for an organization where I felt so invested in and where I'm the only limitation in my learning or growth and being able to grow through the challenges that I face where ne there's never been the same day twice, so to speak. And the fact that I have the ability to have positive influence on change that happens here is, is a special and unique thing that I don't think I will find anywhere else. As a command psychologist, I would end with three things. I think one is the worst day here is better than any day anywhere else. Uh, and I think we just have to keep reminding people of that because it can get, it can be a grind like Wes said, but at the end of the day, my worst day here is better than any single day I've had anywhere else in the Air Force. I think two is um, there is reinforcement here for what we do as long as we keep our eyes open. Like people are appreciative. Uh, people will give us things that demonstrate their appreciation in different ways. And sometimes we just close our eyes to that reinforcement. We need to keep them open. And lastly, you'll never find a job um, where you'll have more purpose, right? Your clarity of purpose and why you do what you do here is evident every single day. And I think that is why people stay here. Um, I think you won't lack for clarity if you join the HBO team at this unit. All right, that's it. I just want to say thanks to all of you. The organization, these seven professionals just gave 14 total hours just to make this podcast. And that means 14 hours of something else wasn't getting done today. So thanks to all y'all for putting it in today. Seriously, it uh, means the world. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Trevor.